Life on Earth has evolved primary endosymbiosis and secondary endosymbiosis and in the dinoflagellates even tertiary endosymbiosis. So life within life within life within life. In the universe, how many levels of nesting can there be? So, how big or small will extraterrestrial life be? That's something we want to try to answer. And one way to answer that is to look at the sizes of life on our planet and the huge diversity of sizes. And we're going to look at the cells, shapes, and sizes, and particularly look at the issue of diffusion and active transport because that, in many ways, determines what the size and shape will, of a life form will be. So, here is Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci. It's a multicellular organism. I'm a multicellular organism. You're a multicellular organism. <laughs> there are 100 trillion cells, maybe 50 trillion cells in your body. And in law, and so, it's 10 to the 14. 10 to the 14. 10 to the 9 is a billion. 10 to the 12 is a trillion. 10 to the 14 is 100 trillion. Now, that's a big thing. But there are things that astro astronomers study, and they're called galaxies. They're big too, and they have parts, and there are a hundred billion stars or so in a galaxy. So that means that the, your body has a thousand times more cells than a galaxy has stars. So here's the Vitruvian Man, here's a galaxy. Let's look more carefully at the cells of a person, and let's look at skin cells, and this is what skin cells look like. Let's look more carefully at the stars of a galaxy, and this is what they look like. Interesting pieces of a larger whole. Now, we're trying to answer the question, how big or how small could ETs be? Will they be bacteria, or will they be like Yoda and us, the multicellular organism with trillions of cells, or will they be something like an entire planet that somehow has evolved and organized and helps itself to stay alive? We don't know. But let's look a little bit more at life on Earth. Life, uh, life forms are open systems. That means that they have to exchange liquids and gases to get nutrients with the environment. So here's a tomato plant. And if you look under, at the underside of a leaf of a tomato plant, you will see the hole here. It's a stoma. And that, what it does, it exchanges what gives off CO2 and it gives off uh, CO2 comes in and H2O goes out, and in a sense you're having transport, active transport through this big system. Now, if you are as small as this bacterium, maybe it's a pollen grain, but it might be, let's just say it's a bacterium, then you can rely on diffusion because act, there's things brownie in motion and things moving around, and things will diffuse out and diffuse in, and maybe you don't need as much active transport. Here's Prochlorococcus, that's very small, it's less than one micron, so I think it's 0.6 microns. Remember, a micron is 10 to the minus 6 meters, or a thousandth of a millimeter. <coughs> the largest animal on Earth is a blue whale, and here you can see it's much, much, much bigger than a Prochlorococcus. But in, if you ask what's the largest mass, what, what life form has the largest mass, then you have to talk, look at this. This is Pando. It's a clonal colony of quaking aspen. It has a common root system, so they're, they're genetically identical. You might refer to it as an organism, or you might say it's a thousands and thousands of identical twins connected by the roots. It's hard to say. When you get to these largest sizes, things become a little bit more ambiguous. Also, you can say, well, wait a minute. That's the, maybe the largest mass. What about the largest area in aerial size? Well, that, that uh, probably belongs to the armillaria. Astoya. It's got nine square kilometers of fungal colony. It's a wonderful thing. So that's kind of the diversity of sizes of life forms on Earth. Also, we have the largest single-celled organism, that's Physarium polycephalum. And what that means is slime many-headed, so, or many-headed slime. Essentially, it's a, it's a multinucleated single cell. So we all have one single cell, this whole organism, but it has many nuclei inside of it. So that's kind of a var variation on a theme. And here's a cholerpa, it's a green algae. 
It also is a single cell, but it has multiple nucleus, nuclei, and it can be as large as 30 meters in size. So we're used to unicellular things with one nucleus, and we're used to multicellular things where each cell has a nucleus. But I've just shown you things that are unicellular, but they have multiple nuclei inside of them. Now, how do you get such a thing? Well, there are two ways of becoming a multinucleated single cell. One is called a syncytium, where many cells come together and then their cell walls dissolve and they leave one big cell with multiple nuclei inside of it. That's why it's called polycephalum. There's another way, and that is called a cyanocyte. You start with a single cell, and then inside that single cell, the nucleus divides, so you have two nuclei. And then those two not divide, and then you have four nuclei, et cetera, et cetera, and you end up with a single cell with many nuclei inside of it. So those are two variations on a theme that you see on life on Earth. Now, a process that's important for life is e any kind of thing, a rock or a tree, no, a rock or a moon or anything, has diffusion going on. And that's something associated with being not alive. But active transport is something that life forms do. And since ET will be an open system, it, it too will have to deal with the issue of diffusion. So here's the single cell, and we call that, one way to understand this is the number of dimensions. A single cell is kind of like a zero-dimensional object where diffusion is more effective. But then you, if you want to increase this surface area, you can, uh, get, you can make a filament, a 1D structure. And you can see that this uh, bacteria, although we say bacteria are not multicellular, you can see that it has produced a filament and it has several types of, of cell types. Those big yellow things, for example, are not like the green blobs. But then most bacteria, or many bacteria, produce bacterial mats, one on top of the other, and they kind of, it's like an ecosystem of bacterial mats, and it's a two-dimensional structure. And two dimensions is very good because it allows you to have each cell to have access to the environment. Then we have unicellular eukaryotes. They're much, much bigger than the single cells of, of uh, bacteria, and therefore you need some type of transport, and so they have a much more sophisticated system of active transports and cytoskeletons inside of them. And so it's kind of 3D, but then we have the uh, multicellular eukaryotes like elephants and us and fungi, and there we, there's a giant three-dimensional structures which need vascularization, we have blood systems, you need to have, uh, you need to pull in air and then have it distributed around the body, and if you have heat, get rid of heat, you make a giant ear that's a two-dimensional structure or a radiator. So where are these things on the tree of life? Well, all of these, uh, we're, what we're trying to do is improve diffusion. And for the zero, one, and two-dimensional structures, they're all bacteria. And the three-dimensional structures are the eukaryotes in the lower right of the, of the phylogenetic tree. You can see eukaryotes. And then the epistochons are the fungi and the elephants and the animals. And they, too, are in the lower right. So you can see that the large objects, the large bodies, are, are restricted to the green part of this phylogenetic tree. Maybe a planet with extraterrestrials will be like Earth, with unicellular and multicellular life, with colonies of thousands and millions, billions and trillions, even hundreds of trillions of cells like our bodies. At the same time, maybe each of those cells will be like a Matryoshka doll. It'll have endosymbionts cooperating with secondary endosymbionts and cells within cells within cells like a Matryoshka doll. Endosymbionts doing endo cooperation and cells within cells within cells. When will this end? Are there any limits to endosymbiosis? There doesn't seem to be. Oh, there it is. <laughs> this, is this is too small to be divided.